It's 6.32, very nearly. Let's have a look at uh, some of today's papers. And, of course, uh, Israel very much dominating the front pages. Yes, concerns over the Israeli ground invasion is on the front of the eye. Their headline, no escape, Gazans try to flee but face Israel's revenge. Uh, the Guardian says thousands flee ahead of the inspected invasion. Whilst The Telegraph reports that Israel has already sent in some forces and warns of a powerful offensive to follow. Times this morning focuses on the story of a disabled teenage girl, one of the 150 people taken hostage by Hamas last week. And The Mirror reveals that police here in the UK are on high alert for a terror attack as the situation in the Middle East unfolds. OK, let's go through... Uh, actually, we'll, and we'll, we'll steer away from the Middle East a little bit as we go through some of the other headlines this morning with assistant editor of The Spectator, Cindy Yu, and political editor of HuffPost UK, Kevin Schofield. Good to see you both morning, this morning. Good morning. Dare we mention COVID, Cindy? Yeah. <laughs> In The Times this morning, Boris Johnson, uh, whether you like him or not, got a lot of stick from a lot of people over lockdown and all the rules, all the rest of it. According to The Times... He wasn't in charge. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, well, according to Simon Case, actually, who was the Cabinet Secretary during the pandemic and actually still is the Cabinet Secretary, <laughs> some... Is um, he indeed? He is, yeah. indeed. And um, some messages that he has sent on WhatsApp has now come out of the COVID inquiry, that thing that's still going on while yeah. the world moves on, um, saying that I always got told that Dom was in control, but I, how, look, how much I look forward to telling the select committee tomorrow, oh, F, no... Don't worry about Dom, the real person in charge is Carrie, meaning Carrie Simmons or Carrie Johnson, the, uh, yeah. the, the Prime Minister's wife. Incredibly unprofessional messages to be sending um, to political appointees of Downing Street, you know, bearing in mind that Simon Case is meant to be a civil servant mm. with impartiality. Incredibly unprofessional messages to be sending in the workplace anyway. Um, so all of this is coming out, and as I say, he is still the Cabinet Secretary. But being also incredibly unprofessional if the Prime Minister's wife yeah. or girlfriend or whatever she was at the time is, in effect, running the country. Yes, I think the problem that they had here was what over one of the uh, one of the regional circuit breakers, as we used to call them at the time, where Boris Johnson seems to have said one thing to one person and then whoever was the last person to talk to him, he would then adopt their perspective. So Carrie, obviously, having very easy access to him, mm. made a lot of people in Downing Street think, <clears throat> well, she's the last person who spoke to him and he's changed his mind since I last spoke to him. Well, we always knew there was tension between her and Dominic Cummings, Absolutely, didn't we? yeah. I mean, yeah. that was very widely known. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And the, um, these messages were sent in November 2020, which was also the same month that Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane left mm -hmm. number 10, mainly because of the friction Carrie. between them and, and Carrie. So, obviously, they had an axe to grind. But it's just, yeah... As Cindy says, it's hugely embarrassing. And these um, messages have been provided to the inquiry by Dominic Cummings, uh. mischievous to the last, yeah. you know, absolutely dumping everyone in it, um, including Simon Case. And we just were saying earlier, it must be so embarrassing for Simon Case. He's still there in the office yesterday. This story drops. And, you know, what kind of respect can you have for the guy who's the most senior civil servant in the country when you know that he's, like, on his phone sending messages in little private WhatsApp groups slagging people off behind their back. I mean, it's just so... No, i tell you what. i tell you what I find really interesting about this is getting the view of politicos mm. who... Because, obviously, you live in the Westminster bubble and, yeah. and you've, you, but your emphasis on, on this has both been isn't this embarrassing for Simon Case? <laughs> Whereas my view is I don't care about Simon Case. Yeah. I care about the fact that someone who's not elected appears to have been making all the decisions. True. Yeah, no, well, that's you don't, very good point. You don't know that. that's true. You just know that that's what they were having a good old go at her about. You know, I've got very good gossip, but, yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think it's safe to say that Carrie um, knows her own mind and was very political mm. and, as Cindy said, had easy access to Boris Johnson, who is notorious for basically swinging in the wind, just will repeat what the person who he's speaking to wants I mean, to hear. I mean, we, the, the green agenda sort of stuff was sure. very much blamed very much on so. her, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And then during the Afghanistan withdrawal, the stuff about those animals in that animal rescue in mm. Kabul. But I think, you know, I, I do think, you know, Kevin's right about this, which is that people who voted for Boris Johnson, who wanted him to be leader, knew what kind of character he was. They knew that he was a yes man, you know, trying to please everyone. So the... It's not a surprise that he would be 
kind of not I just think it's, it's, it's very perspective. easy for all of these men on their WhatsApp groups. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but I'll go Absolutely. at the woman. Well, that's also no, a agree. terrible look, isn't it? You know, their their basically noses are out of joint because they are, you know, Dominic Cummings was the chief advisor to um, Boris Johnson. Lee Kane was his director of communications. They want to be the ones mm. influencing Boris Johnson and telling him what to do, basically. And their noses are out of joint because Carrie Simmons is upstairs in the flat in his ear and she's the most influential out of all of them. Mm. And I think, as we see, ultimately, that's what led to them leaving. And Stephen, one other thing about the rhetoric here as well, it's just Simon Case says stuff like, um, I cannot cope with this, which just sounds like a millennial having a bit of a mental health crisis. I can't cope with this, I have to go home. Yeah, he's you know, talking going home, he's just... I mean, incredibly... Really mean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bizarre yeah, yeah. language. Job he's got, he should be a rather able to large job, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. one would hope. No, yeah. I, I think this is just whinging men. Do you? <laughs> I really do. <laughs> I think it's terribly easy to have a go at Carrie, isn't it? Yes. Why? No, I agree. Oh, no, I, I, I disagree. I disagree. <laughs> I disagree. We know I think... she's a strong person. We know that. We, yeah. As you say, quite single-minded, and she knows she, ha she believed very strongly in some of her big issues. Yeah. Why shouldn't she have Prime Minister's ear? They're married. Yes, not... but, but I tell Well, look, it's not to blame her... It's, it's blaming him, really, but you may well be married to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but you're not elected, and you shouldn't be swayed... You know, it's, the Prime Minister should be able to not pay that much attention to political or social comments from their spouse and deal with running the country. Do you think Tony Blair never took any notice of what Sherry said to him? Well, I don't think Margaret Thatcher took much notice of Dennis. Well, Dennis just poured her a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis just poured her a drink, said there, there, didn't he? I mean, yeah. He was a real comfort and a support. Well, you but you should... I, he well, you should have his own issue. Well, yeah, I would say that consort. Hugh Kane, Dominic yeah. Cummings and Simon Case, none of them are elected either, so... No, that's a fair, that's, <laughs> that's a fair point. That's fair, but actually their job, I guess. I don't know. Love your thoughts on that one. <laughs> Are we, am I being unfair or not? I don't know. Uh, GBviews at gbnews.com. Kevin, um, before I implode, <laughs> um, calm <laughs> me down. Calm me down, yeah. Yeah, well, I heard you talking about this earlier. So this is this column uh, by uh, Dr Michael Muslin in the Mail talking about how, yeah, things are quite stressy at the moment and news is pretty miserable and just life in general just feels quite... Jesse, so he's come up with a, a column on the various things you can do to, to de-stress that don't involve medication or even any kind of medical intervention. So you mentioned make yourself a cup of tea. Yeah. Very British way of dealing with stress. Um, but other ways include uh, having a hug. So cuddling a, oh, I love a friend couple. or loved one. That's what Princess Diana used to say, do you remember? She said yeah. the, the value of hugging. Did she? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, yeah, well, she was spot on. Um, chewing gum. Oh, I hate that. I find that quite surprising. Yeah, apparently, apparently he does that, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, because he, he says he gets cravings, uh, something's when he's stressed for, like, chocolate or biscuits, and he decides, no, I'll have some sugar-free gum, and that... It hurts my down. teeth, chewing gum. <laughs> makes my teeth hurt. I don't know why. <laughs> There you go, something but, but, you didn't need to know. <laughs> he makes the point that this isn't just trivial, this is actually scientifically... Yeah, yeah, there's it, a study... It reduces Cardiff, levels of cortisol or something. Yeah, Card Cardiff University, um, and it reduces um, stress. It was, they asked students to chew gum, and the group that did were less mm. stressed. Yeah. Or um, just head off to the woods for a nice... Uh, uh, the relaxing walk that I in the countryside. Understand. You can't feel fresh that air, walk. exercise, and particularly to go through trees. You mm. know, to go yeah, that's right. Amongst trees, walk in the woods, because yeah. apparently they have, I don't know, pheromones, is it, or something You'll like that. You'll be inhaling now. Um, forgive my pronunciation. Phytoncides. That doesn't sound right. But anyway, these are essential oils a bit dodgy, that, that, uh, that give off. Um, that have been shown to enhance mood and bolster our immune system. Mm -hmm. So, so there we go. So if you're feeling a bit stressed, so if you're understandably stressy, right now. Go make a cup of tea, but not yet. Have, phytoncides. phytoncides have antibacterial and antifungal qualities which help plants help disease. When people breathe in these chemicals, our bodies respond by increasing the number and activity of a type of white blood cells, mm. which are natural killer cells. These kill tumours and viruses in our body. Wow. So it's, good, it's good for your health. So there you go, we all need to walk through woods yeah, while chewing gum. And drinking gum. With, 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 with a cup of tea in your yes. hand. <laughs> I tell you what, a cup of tea in a flask, a flask of tea on a walk in a wood. Mm, it's very nice. Perfect. Mm. Oh, no, that's, that's heaven to me. That's your Saturday afternoon sorted.
Uh, meanwhile, um, someone who seems to be getting very stressed is a Conservative councillor, Cindy, called Matthew Goodwin Freeman, who's been wandering around yeah. uh, blocking ULES cameras. Yeah, Not that I... we can blame him, necessarily. Sorry? Not that we can blame him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, he's doing it in very non... non well, I was going to say non-obtrusive. He is being definitionally obtrusive, but he's not being destructive. Well, look, there he is. We can see So he's him. just covering, basically, these vans. Behind that sign, these vans have those cameras, which track speed. Uh, and, yeah, and, and he's blocking them with just various signs. Are they conservative signs, by yeah, the way? Yeah, they're chance? conservative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Publicity. So um, he's not actually wrecking the cameras? Or no, no, exactly. Like and, 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 and in his Twitter thread, he's very good at saying, you know, it's not a van driver's fault, don't make their work, don't make their lives harder, you know, they're just employed by Sadiq Khan, it's Sadiq Khan's fault. Um, and Harrow, which is his um, council, um, is one of those ones which is split by the ULES uh. Uh, expansion. So people in Harrow could be driving on one street, and then suddenly they'll be in a ULS flow and then suddenly they won't be. So it's very mm. confusing. And actually, only a week ago, uh, over 900 drivers was found to have been mistakenly fined uh, by ULS cameras what in Harrow. It? And so they had to get refunded. So it's just... Again, it's just the frictions in expanding this without proper public information, without also just proper oversight over how good these cameras are, because apparently that camera uh, that mistakenly fined people was just looking at the wrong borders. I mean, you'd think uh, that they'd at least get that kind of stuff right. You'd, well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? I mean, I have yeah. to say, though, um, whereas part of me wants to applaud him for making a stand, because I just... I don't, I don't agree with it, but I don't live in London, so I mean, what I think doesn't matter. Um, and he presumably isn't doing anything illegal because he's not touching the cameras yeah. in any way, shape or form. Yeah, and he's but not it's, damaging them. But it's yeah. still a PR stunt, isn't it? Because he's not stood up there like this for several hours at a time, is he? The Conservative. The Conservative. <laughs> he's, only, he's only stood there for as long as it takes to take yeah. a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's so. making a point, isn't he? But he's making a but point. But it shows also that the Conservatives see this as a real... Um, dividing line with Labour, you know, and that there are votes in it, as we saw in yes. the Oxford by election. Well, so. absolutely. I mean, it's that's why that's why you're getting the clear blue water. Yeah, well, that's why it? you're getting this war on motorists. Mm. Um, and Sadiq Khan is not backing down, conflict. even though Keir Starmer has asked him to back down. So it's also a Labour civil war going on about, about this. Yeah, I mean, is it a, um, a, a poll tax moment for Sadiq Khan, do you think? Well, I think it could be if any of the alternatives were better. <laughs> But the Conservative candidates are not very inspiring, so I think Sadiq Khan is probably quite secure. In the Although region. the way they've changed... The, there was a poll a couple of weeks ago only put him two points in front of mm. Susan Hall, who, you're right, is not a great candidate, but you never know. And the way that the, they've changed the voting system for the Labour... for the London Mayor... Oh, IDs and all um, that. Well, there's that, but also um, it's just a straight first-past-the-post. So if... Oh, right. So you can be elected on, say, 35% of the vote if you get the most votes... Yeah. Certainly, ULES, she, she, ULES she might well win. turn out to be his Achilles heel. It could end up, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, interesting stuff. Let us know if you've got any thoughts on that. It is 6.45. If you've just joined us, let's remind you of the top stories this morning. And a week on since the devastating terror attack on Israel by Hamas, the conflict shows no sign of subsiding. Israel is continuing its bombardment and blockade of the Gaza Strip. Tens of thousands of civilians in Gaza flee to the south of the Strip after Israel gave over one million Palestinians just 24 hours to evacuate. And Israel says they've conducted raids into Gaza overnight as a full-scale ground offensive is expected imminently. We're live in Tel Aviv throughout the programme. Well, Kevin and Cindy are still with us looking uh, at the, what's in, inside the papers at the moment. And, Kevin, you found this story about the Novichok House in Salisbury. Yeah, um, I was absolutely stunned to discover that that was five and a half years ago. That was happened. it? March 2018. Oh, you can't believe that, can you? It was such no. a long time ago. But uh, pre-pandemic, everything... Yes, the yeah, time yeah, has yeah. changed. Was. But, of course, this yeah. was where um, the two people, it was... I can't remember their names now. Yes, yeah, so he was a former KJ, Sergei Skripal, yeah. right. and his daughter, Yulia. So they, they were... lived in the house and, um, obviously, they, they became incredibly ill, nearly yeah. died, yeah. Um, from what we later found was Novichok. Novichok. It was on the door handle. And on the door handle, the and exactly. Um, and they were found um, on a park bench, desperately ill, but, but, they, but they did survive. But obviously, understandably, um, weren't living in the house anymore. Um, so, anyway, uh, it went on the market 
the following year, in 2019, and... Nobody interested. Nobody interested. No. But it turns out that actually, finally, it was sold for £375,000 in February this year. So there's a family living there. Now, it, it does say it underwent hundreds of hours of deep cleaning, as you would expect. Uh, yeah. The front door and the porch have been replaced, again, un understandably. Um, now, neighbours had said that... Uh, some neighbours had said they wanted it knocked down. The local council were concerned that it, was, it would become some sort of museum for um, macabre. Mm. Um, it didn't need to be knocked down. No, well, no. I was just thinking, you know, in the middle of a... I know it's only one house, but, you know, we do have a housing crisis in this country, and if it's a perfectly habitable yeah. house, there's nothing to suggest, you know, that anyone shouldn't live in it, then um, then why not? But um, I so guess a it's family with young children? A family with young there. children now, now living there, uh, a local couple with young children um, living there, Presumably quite quite happily. Well, I mean, good on them, I suppose. Nice yeah, house. if it's been through all of that incredible mm. deep cleaning, then mm. why not? I guess. Absolutely, but yeah, I suppose it's always there at the back of your mind as to what went on there. Mm. But, um, but but it's like houses where where murders are carried out mm. and things. When I mean, they all get sold eventually, a lot of them don't. Uh, well, some most do get of locked them. down though. Yeah, but but it's not many, is it? No. The particular no. notorious ones, I guess. It's, you know, yeah, those the, West like and Fred West. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah, ones get knocked down. The really grim ones. Yeah. But, but I think it's rather nice that you've got a young family in there now. Oh, and yeah. they can give it new memories, can't Absolutely. they? Absolutely, yeah. And these, these kids I mean, won't have yeah, any memory of, of what happened. It's just extraordinary, because I know Salisbury quite well now, and mm. it's such a lovely place. Every time you were in there, you can't imagine that happening. Small, yeah, quite sweet. <clears throat> yeah, and, and also what's devastating is the Brit who died uh, from this. Yes, um, yeah, that's right. Named Dawn, Dawn Sturgis. I yeah. Think. yeah. Um, who picked up that picked up perfume, the perfume bottle, bottle yeah. Mm. Yeah, who was really the um, you know unwitting victim of all of that. Actually, I um, near where I live in Greater London, one of the houses was implicated at the time in 2018, and they knocked that one down. Really? And they, because they thought, you know, um, I think it was an ex-Russian oligarch as well and lived around there, uh -huh. and they did knock that house down, and they've been rebuilding it over the last few years, and now I think new new family live there now but I was quite intrigued that they didn't knock it down because I think you know the plan would have been just to rebuild it immediately mm. but I guess if you replace the door <laughs> <laughs> well yeah <laughs> Yeah. But you just, okay, yeah, I mean, you really have to trust the cleaners, don't you? Well, you do. I'm glad they're in it, though, and I'm glad well, they're, yeah. you know, a good, lovely That's family cool, home. Yeah. A new lease of life. Um, let's talk foreign aid, should we, Cindy? Uh, this is in The Guardian <laughs> this morning. Two billion pounds of UK foreign aid has been... And it's climate aid mm. has been channelled through consultancies. Yeah. So, look, I mean, when you're a young graduate, all these consultancies come to you, like McKinsey or KPMG, PricewaterhouseCooper, and say, you can be doing amazing things around the world. You know, you could be going to Africa, helping them with their climate crisis. You could be going here, going there. And actually, what the reverse side of that coin is governments paying these consultancies huge amount of money uh, through taxpayers' money to tackle these local issues. But when actually local charities say that's money we better spent directly going to charities, going to community communities, rather than these Western <laughs> middlemen who are going to come into a problem afresh, think that they can solve everything, and then leave after six months. So, you know, £2 billion have been channeled through consultancies. To be fair, it is since 2010, so that's 13 years ago. Mm. Uh, but, you know, some quick math, that's just under £200 million a year spent on consultancies or foreign aid when it could be going to local communities directly. So the question is, how useful are these consultants? Yes, yeah, so are they any good at what they yeah. do? Exactly. I mean, yeah. just this week, KPMG was... Um, that's one of the consultancies named here. Just this week, KPMG was fined for Carillion for not properly auditing mm. that giant firm's uh, failure back... Well, I think that was also back in 2018 or 2019. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's real questions over just how effective these people brought, being brought in from the outside really are when so much money is being spent on them. You always yeah. do wonder about consultancies, don't you? Because you hear of people in the city getting wonderful jobs with consultancies yeah. and they're paid an absolute yeah, fortune absolutely. and you wonder yeah. what they do. And, and it's, it's all taxpayers' money as well. well you yeah. know, it's all yeah. come from us. All. And that's but similar the, the, But the, There is a question, isn't there, as to if how do you give money directly to these communities? communities and make sure it is managed and spent in the way that it should be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the UN is obviously another one of those giant organisations which is not necessarily a good use of money, but actually, you know, I think there are meant to be local charities uh, with local experience who are desperate for this kind of money. Mm. You're right, it will be less centralised um, and you'll have to really kind of do your homework to know who's reliable, who's doing the good stuff. Mm. But maybe it's worthwhile to spend that money on that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, talk, talking of money... 
Talking of money, what do you make of this? And it's front page of The Sun this morning. Nine million quid the BBC, BBC studios have paid out to, to Freddie Flintoff over his Top Gear accident. Uh, look, he's clearly been very seriously yeah, injured. Yeah. But it's nine million quid of taxpayers' money, basically, isn't it? Well, yeah, it does make you think... How... Uh, it's not to criticise him, but it still seems a bit weird. Uh, it must have been some accident. I mean, the details have obviously been very sketchy, yeah. and you've only got to look at them. And this is, what, nine, ten months on since it happened? Oh, and more. He's, more. And more. He's, his face... Is his face, his, his teeth don't look. No, I mean, right. everybody talks about it as they they saw it, say it was life altering injuries. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can. Well, you see, yeah, you see what it looked like before, and you see what it looks like now. Yeah. Obviously, there's been. You wouldn't recognise him. No, actually, there's been you? a really significant injury. But yeah, I was taken aback when I saw nine million pounds. But obviously, his lawyers, BBC's lawyers, this has been going on for quite some time. Um, and he hasn't sued them. The, the, the claim is, if he'd have sued them, he could have got a lot more, and he hasn't done that. It's all meant to be amicable. Yeah. Um, but it's just the fact that it's ultimately our money. Yeah. What is it? Or well, would it I be mean, insurance money? I, oh. I guess so, yeah. And also, the BBC have other revenue streams as well, but it is still £9 million coming out of the BBC budget, which is already, we know, being slashed quite considerably. There's jobs being lost left, right and centre. Um, but £9 million quid is a lot of money. Mm. But he was obviously very successful... Broadcast. This will affect his career going it's forward. It's meant to have been calculated on two years of un unearned earnings. Um, wow! Which means that he was doing quite well. He was anyway. doing incredibly well, mm. but obviously, I mean, I guess this will affect his um, career future. going going yes. forward. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I guess he's he's entitled to it. But yeah, it does, on the face of it, look like an extraordinary amount of money. We've got to we've we've got to find out what actually happened. Don't we? I mean, it seems there's going to be some. Expose it. Well, yeah, given it, as you say, the BBC are partially at least publicly funded, I think, and there needs to be transparency as to how this. Um, I always came think about. that when, you know, when, when there's some terrible medical problem and, um, and the uh, medical health trust is made to fork out an enormous amount of money in a, in a fine or compensation, you think, I totally understand that and don't begrudge it to the person who deserves that, but it's still taxpayers' money. Mm. Um, our, our hospitals are cash-strapped as it is. Mm. Yeah, and, and there'll be a, a legal duty on them to make sure that that money is spent mm. well... Um, and that they can justify it and mm. account for it. So, but it's an institutional yeah. thing, isn't it? I mean, the BBC, you know, Top Gear is often was a dangerous show. Yeah. Yes. You know, so if if the BBC wants to have that kind of risk factor to have for entertainment, then they're going to have to kind of pay out when it doesn't go. When so it goes wrong for hospital trusts. Yeah. You know, um, if they don't have nurses or doctors that are not making mistakes, then they've got to pay out. Yeah. Uh, let's cheer ourselves up, should we? Um, after that, with our uh, little angels. These South Korea Zoo and yep. these two little panda. Three month old giant panda twins um, have finally been unveiled to the public at, at South Korea Zoo. Um, the thing about panda. Oh, look at them. I mean, they're so. Oh, they're gorgeous. They're just ridiculously cute, aren't they? <laughs> oh, my, listen to the little thing. And for thing. big pandas, they make little squeaky noises. I know. They do. Now, experts say that if it wasn't for humans, pandas wouldn't be around because no, they they'd you know, they'd, they'd have been. Um, but. Oh. Thank goodness we've got them around. They used to have them um, at Edinburgh Zoo and me and the family went to see them <laughs> last year or earlier er er this year. And it's amazing, the queues to go and see pandas and they don't do anything, they just sit there. <laughs> yeah, no, but, uh, um, something treasure, isn't it? Re Rebao and Huibai. Uh, Rebao, yeah, Huibao. Yeah, like, half a million people yeah. voted to, to name them. And that's yeah, what yeah. they're called? If it was here, they'd be called Panda McPanda face. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Um, but oh, they're is, they? oh, they are amazing. They'd be wow. quite a good job to be keepers for pandas. You know, they're oh, just quite great, gentle, they? aren't they? You know, yeah, they don't any... do a lot. They just they sit there and eat. But it's also, I don't know if you've seen um, videos of keepers trying to feed them or bathe them or stuff like that. They're just like giant toddlers. Yeah. Giant, yeah. soft toddlers. <laughs> yeah. They just have kind of manhandle them from one place to another because they're so oh, mischievous as well. Yes, There's great videos on, on YouTube of them rolling around. and yeah. oh, well, We'll brilliant. dig those well, out. Thank um, you for a happy story. It's nice to have one. Yes, indeed, and we'll see you both a little bit later on. Uh, but in the meantime, let's have a look at the weather.